Be seated. I believe our senior saints are singing for us. Is that right? Come ahead. Yes. Brother Al's looking at me with a question mark on his face. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, open your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 20, 1 Timothy 6, and verse number 20, and while you're turning there, let me get you to add two people to your prayer list. Um, pray for Bob Dustman, he pastored at Basel for a number of years at the same church where Brother uh, Jim Brown pastored before him, 
and Brother Dustman is in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, in Powell, Tennessee, and Brother Clarence Sexton's church, and he's he's had a he's had a lot of health problems the last few years, and uh, had his pancreas removed because of cancer, and uh, he's now on dialysis, which is uh, not directly re related to the cancer, but because he had his pancreas removed, it's a uh, it's a uh, problem of overloading his kidneys and not doing the job. So pray for Bob Dustman. Uh, and then pray for Mark Varney, V-A-R-N-E-Y. Mark Varney is a friend I met through uh, through Facebook. Uh, he, we converse a little bit. He uh, seems to be a like-minded uh, missionary, church planning preacher in the Philippines, and his name is Mark Varney. And he uh, he contacted me, and just asked if we'd be if we'd be kind enough to pray for them. And I said, well, sure. So I'll bring up your name tonight. And so I've done it, Brother Mark. If you're watching on the internet. We're going to be praying for you, pray for your family there in the Philippines. Well, we're, uh, we're in a series on evolution versus creation, and tonight in 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 6, did I say 6? Yeah, 6 verse 20, and uh, I want to read just uh, one verse, and then we'll get right into the presentation. The Bible says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in this time as we seek to give honor and glory to your precious name because we believe with all of our heart that you created everything, the whole universe, our earth and people and animals and everything just as you said in six days without any aid of, of uh, evolution. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have these lessons burned indelibly into our hearts that we might pass them on to our children and grandchildren and those we have influence over. And Lord, we ask that we might be allowed to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ in this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I believe it's important that we study evolution. I hope, I hope you don't just have the idea that well, this is just a this is just a scientific issue, and uh, you know it's a technical thing. Doesn't really it really doesn't affect me. Oh, it does. It affects all of us because it's an attack on the Word of God. It's an attack upon uh, upon the character of God. It's a, it's an attack upon our way of life as Christians. We believe God, and so therefore it's important for every Christian to know how to answer those who would attack our God and His Word. And so tonight we want to talk about this specific thing. Uh, did God use evolution? There are Christians who believe that, yeah, the Bible's true, and they also believe that uh, evolution happened. And so the question that arises is this. Can Christians believe both the Bible and evolution? Can you? <laughs> well, let's explore that possibility tonight and think about it. And... Uh, this thing is not wanting to work again. Why does it do that? We have uh, we have demons present with us because we're attacking their philosophy. Well, we'll just do it the old-fashioned way. And so we're going to start off. What we're going to do is ask a, a, a series of questions, try to answer them with this PowerPoint presentation, and then, Lord willing, <laughs> we're going to do that video presentation that we tried last week, and the guy kept getting... A frog in his throat and he couldn't go any further so tonight we're going to help him out we got it preloaded and we believe it's going to work but first why do some Christians believe evolution well some people believe it some Christians say they believe evolution because some scientists they believe some believe it because scientists have proved evolution but is that true it's not true now, they present it in the public school system and in our universities and on the TV shows, National Geographic and the History Channel and all of those sorts of things. They present it as though it's fact. And when they debate, they, they make fun of the uh, creationists and, uh, and mock them as though, why, you've got to be some sort of clown if you believe in creation. Evolution is proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it's not been proved at all. Why do some Christians believe in evolution? Well... Some Christians haven't studied the issue at all. They've just what, heard what somebody else said, and so they accept it. 
Can I just tell you something? That one of the reasons we ought to attend a Bible preaching church and to carry our Bible with us when we go to church is so we can look and see if what's being preached is true. We ought to go to the place where we believe we're getting fed the Word of God and then take a Bible and look and see does the Word of God support what He's saying or what's being taught in our Sunday school class or in, in uh, some other sort of class setting. And so some have just not studied the issue. Why do some Christians believe in evolution? Well, because they want to appear to be intellectual. The intellectuals <laughs> believe that it is far more sophisticated to believe scientifically that evolution surely happened. Well, it might, sound, it might sound intellectual as all get out, but it's not proven. It's not a fact. In fact, they try to convince you through means of, get this, they try to convince you that evolution is true. They'll refer to scientific data, but when it comes down to it, they're trying to get you to believe in evolution through faith. <laughs> they want you to by faith accept what they're saying. They don't have it proved, but it looks more intellectual, you see. And so some other Christians believe in evolution because why? Because they want to change the church. When I say the church, I'm speaking generically of uh, churches all over the world. They want to change the church. And friend, we are going through a huge change in the churches today. The church is not like it used to be. Churches are going uh, full force, full bore into trying to make the church just a little happier place, a little more accepting kind of place, trying to make it a little more where everybody will feel welcome no matter what they believe. Now, we want everybody to feel welcome when they come here, but we're not going to change the teaching of the truth. We're not, going to, we're not going to deny the Word of God because we want people to come in. We want them to come in to hear the unadulterated truth. Isn't that right? We don't want them to come here uh, just because they can believe anything they want to believe. We want them to come and then teach them the truth while they're here. So some people just want to make the church more accepting and see they're afraid that if our church believes creationism, we're not going to get some of those doctors and lawyers and PhDs and some of the more sophisticated people and some of those people who are highly educated won't come to our church if we don't just kind of stay away from those sorts of controversial things. But that's why some people believe it. Some people believe in evolution. Why? Because they just don't believe it's important to study it. They just don't think it's a big deal one way or the other. You believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe. And after all, we just go to church together and we'll be happy together. And uh, is that all there is to it? Well, that's not all there is to it because when, if we don't get concerned, if we don't believe it's important that all the Bible is true, then the next generation won't accept any of the Bible. And so it is important. And uh, some people believe that evolution is true. Why? Because some were just never taught creation in the first place. All they've heard is evolution. And they haven't been exposed. And so... That means that it's up to us, listen, it's up to us to teach them while they're here the truth about creation. And our, our boys and girls that are growing up, thank God for moms and dads who bring their kids to church so that they can learn creation from the beginning so that they're not just automatically accepting. Yes, sir. I don't, I think... I think pretty much all of them believe it. I just don't think very many of them teach it, Brother Paul. I don't think they do. It's in the church I grew up in. It was not an independent fundamental Baptist church. It's a free will Baptist church. But I, I, I remember maybe in Sunday school class some references to creation. But I don't remember anything definitively being taught on an adult level where, where it was set in contradistinction against evolution and that it was better to believe creation than evolution. So, yeah, some people just never heard anything else. I mean, you go to, you go to, uh, you go to Columbia University in New York and, uh, and talk about creation among their, among their students and some of them are going to look at you really funny. You go to some of the, some of the seminaries, used to be seminaries, 
Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, some of the Ivy League universities in America now that are prestigious, that once were founded to train preachers to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You go there today and start talking about creation, and they'll kick you off the campus. They'll think you're a nut. So some people just never heard. And uh, so what does the Bible say about creation? Well, look at this. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11 says, For in six days, you got that? Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. That's what the Bible says. Now, can you, be, can you believe everything that evolution says and everything that the Bible says simultaneously? There's a contradiction there, isn't there? The Bible says very plainly in Exodus 20, some people go back to Genesis in the first few chapters and say, well, that's just all fairy tale, that's myth, that's figurative speech. Well, in Exodus, was he still talking in figurative speech when he got there? Moses thought it was the, uh, the, the 24-hour periods. Six days he created and rested on the seventh. Well, what does the Bible say about creation? What about Isaiah 42, 5? Thus saith the Lord, uh, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, that's life. <laughs> he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. That's what the Bible says, that God created everything. What does the Bible say about creation? Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. The Bible's saying God is strong enough that he don't need no stinking evolution. <laughs> he can just speak it into existence. That's what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about creation? Well, Colossians 1.16 in the New Testament it says for by him, by Jesus Christ for by him were all things created. How many things? All things that are in heaven, that's out yonder, and that are in earth that's here with us. And notice this, visible and what? Invisible. Would that, would that take into account the molecules and atoms? <laughs> yeah. God created everything, big and small. Uh, those little atoms that he's created and the little molecules those things are like a little solar system all within their cells <laughs> that God is a creator and that's what the Bible says the Bible says that God created everything how did he do it well just like there's a number of verses I could give you here but this one will be uh, indicative of what the Bible says from cover to cover about how God created watch this Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the, word, that the worlds were framed by what? The word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now boy, there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff right there. The Bible's saying that God spoke everything into existence. That's what they call fiat creation, that God spoke it and it appeared. He didn't have to wait millions and billions of years for the scientific laws to kick into action and bring forth life. God spoke it, and it happened. God said, let there be light, and just like that, there was light. He didn't have to wait for a star to form. He made it with the words of his mouth. It's like this. If, if, if I could create the way God did, I could say, here's two microphones. I want a third. Third microphone appear. Boom. There it would be. Well, God spoke the whole universe into existence that same way, by fiat creation. He spoke it, and by the power of his word, it happened immediately. It didn't take millions and billions of years. It didn't take weeks. He did it in six days. And notice what else it says there, that the things which are seen, everything we can see, was made from what? Of things... The things that which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, God didn't have to have pre-existent material. God didn't have to say, now let me see, let me go find some dirt over here that somebody else brought into existence so I can make a man. <laughs> he spoke and made the dirt. 
He spoke and made everything. And so that's the way God created. God didn't need anything except what was in himself. God didn't uh, need the pre-existent material. The Bible states in plain language that God created with his word. The Bible states that the entire body of scripture is equally inspired. Look at this, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture. You see that word all? You ought to underline it in your Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means, that means the first few chapters of Genesis were, were scripture just the same as the New Testament. All scripture. Those verses that we've read in Exodus and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hebrews and Colossians, all those that we just quoted, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when the Bible says it's inspired, it's all inspired, including those creation verses. So number three, what is evolution? What is it? Well, evolution is, first it's materialism. They just, the evolutionists believe that there is no such thing as God, there is no such thing as spirit, there is no unseen world, but there is only what? Only mass and energy. But it seems strange, doesn't it, that even an evolutionist could say only mass and energy are real. There's no spirits, there's no God, there's mass and energy. Where in the world did it come from? Where did it come from? And I never fail to be amazed at those nuts who say, well, probably deposited here, life was deposited here on earth from some space alien. <laughs> well, if that were true, all that does is move the argument to another planet. <laughs> they still, that life had to come from somewhere if it were true. So it doesn't answer anything. What is evolution? That all life comes from a common ancestor. That there was mass, uh, there was rock, and a little piece of rock got chipped off, and somehow there was water from somewhere, and the water and the rock uh, kind of combined and, and dissolved, and, and enough chemicals interreacted over a period of enough billions of years that finally a molecule uh, or two got together and formed a living molecule, and, and from that one cell, finally a one celled amoeba your great great grandfather <laughs> yeah now that's isn't that the truth and they say we believe in fairy tales <laughs> I just cannot believe uh, that they're that gullible and they evolution has to have billions of years to make all this stuff happen and then their fossil record the geologic column the fossils to them declare the history of life and that's where they come from so what would it mean if God did use evolution we're talking about did God use evolution can you believe the Bible and can you believe evolution too well if God did use evolution what would it mean it would mean something very terrible would happen in several places first of all the meaning of scripture would be lost I mean, it says that God spoke the worlds into existence, and if that is not true, if evolution brought life into existence, then, friend, the Bible would not be true. Exodus, where we quoted from Moses, then Moses did not know truth. And if language means anything, when Jesus acknowledged creation and, uh, and the writers of Scripture acknowledged that Jesus made everything and by him all things consist, if those words are not true, then what do they mean? All common sense from interpreting the Bible would go out the window. Not only that, God's creation record is changed. Everything that it says about how God created everything means nothing. And so we've got to go back and figure out what all that means. If it didn't mean what it said, what does it mean? The gospel foundation is destroyed. If, if evolution is true, and think about this. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man, death came upon all. If death entered in by one man, who was that one man? It was Adam. Now, if Adam was not the first life created on the face of the earth, if there were millions of years of death and destruction before that, then death didn't come like the Bible says it did. The Bible says death was brought upon all of mankind and all of creation 
because of the sin of one man, Adam. So if, if evolution happened, then you got millions of years of death before that man. Are you with me? If Adam didn't happen until millions of years later, until those little one-celled animals sprouted wings and tails and grew into a man, then all of those animals died for millions of years and left their fossils before man came on the scene and sin didn't come the way the Bible says it did. Now, before we move off of that, let me, let me ask you one more question. Have you ever thought about this? If, 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 if evolution were true and you got millions of years of animals in their intermediate stages that finally turn into man, now, it didn't just happen according to evolution in one day, did it? Man kind of was a monkey, and then uh, and his tail broke off, and and uh, and he stood up on two legs and started to walk around. And over a period of a few more million years, that monkey eventually, gradually turned into a man. If you believe the Bible, you have to believe that man is a fallen creature, and that he needs a savior for salvation. Why? Because our soul is headed for hell. Now think about this. If evolution were true, on what stage did man have a soul and at what stage did he need a savior? Did the monkey need a savior when he still had a tail? When the tail came off and, and the monkey stood up on two legs and started walking around and chirping like a chimpanzee, did he need a savior then? when he began to lose some of the hair off of his body and he began to look a little bit more like a, a caveman as they represent them? Did he need a savior then? When, at what point was he lost and need a savior and at what point was he still an animal? If it happened over millions of years, where's the dividing line where man would be lost and need a savior? And why is he lost if he wasn't created in a garden of Eden and man fell? by his disobedience to God. Have you ever thought about that? There would not be a place where you could definitively say that the monkey is no longer a monkey. He's now a man and suddenly he has a soul. You can't believe both. You have to believe evolution or the Bible one. Then there's logic, lastly. Logic, uh, there's just one, one little simple argument here. There's a law called the law of non-contradiction. When we study through all of this, it comes down to this, this one thing that we could use the law of logic and disprove evolution. Uh, the law of non-contradiction means that one, if one thing is true, the other can't be true. Like uh, if, we, if we say, if Brother Jimmy says Marcus is here tonight and Miss Brenda says, no, he's not here, they can't both be right, can they? He's either here or he's not. It's one of the two. He's either present or not present. He can't be both here and not here. So that's, a, that's the law of non-contradiction. You can't have it both ways. And so when the Bible is true and we find out that God says he made everybody and that death came upon all men because of the one man's sin, that has to be true. And so therefore it outlaws all of evolution that we couldn't have come any other way. Either God created everything like he said or we might as well fold up our Bible and go away because none of it can be trusted. The law of non-contradiction. Evidence in support of creation is evidence against evolution. Video time. Let's get to it and see if we can make it happen. And let's see. Okay, just before I start this, uh, this part was back before y'all took your trip, I think, <laughs> to India. Uh, stars explode. Uh, according to scientists, astronomers, stars explode and they suddenly grow brighter and they leave this big, uh, obvious trail of their explosion. There's, a, there's three, stra three stages, stage one, two, and three, that a star, a supernova goes through. And uh, each stage would be, according to evolutionists, millions of years between. 
So let's see if it's true. We have the second stage supernova remnants. Those are the stars that may have exploded within the last maybe hundreds of years to maybe thousands and thousands of years. Then we have the third stage supernova remnants, which we classify as stars that have exploded in millions of years ago. Now, if this universe, this galaxy, solar system is billions of years old, we should expect to see a number of these supernova remnants in each one of these stages. In other words, if the universe is billions of years old, we should expect to see at least two recently exploded stars or supernova remnants. If this universe is billions of years old, we should see about 2,260 second stage supernova remnants, ones that have occurred in the last hundreds of years to maybe tens of thousands of years ago. If this universe is billions of years old, we should see at least 5,000 third stage supernova remnants, ones that have occurred millions of years ago. About if this universe is young, say about 7,000 years old, then we should see about two recently exploded stars. If it is young, we should see about 125 in the second stage, ones that have occurred just in the last hundreds of years to tens of thousands of years ago. And if it's young, we should see no supernova remnants that occurred millions of years ago because there hasn't been enough time for those gas and dust clouds to expand that far out. Now, a good test of a model, a good test of the reliability of any theory is how well does it predict what we observe. Now, let's test both of these. What have we actually observed out there? Well, we've actually observed about five recently exploded stars. So both models are doing pretty good prediction there. Both doing pretty good there. Now, how many second stage have we observed? About 200. Which model is doing the better predictive capability there? The young universe. And we have found or observed zero third stage what does that suggest now? What this is suggesting is this universe is not old enough for to have all these star explosions or supernova remnants out there. In other words, evidence for one position is evidence against the other position. The evidence here clearly supports a young universe. Well, let's go to another one, galaxy formation. Galaxies come in different shapes, and one of these shapes is called a spiral galaxy. You observe it and you see it by these long arms spiraling around behind it. And these spiral galaxies have their shape. And if these spiral galaxies are billions of years old, what we believe is they should not exist out there anymore. See, as these galaxies are rotating around, these spirals will generally lose their shape and will just have one great big blob of a galaxy. And the estim estimation is these galaxies, these spiral galaxies, should lose their shape between one and two billion years of rotating around. Now, here's the problem. When we look out there and identify what are supposed to be some of the oldest areas in the universe, some of the oldest galaxies, they still have their spiral shape. What does that suggest? Well, based on all our current calculations, it suggests these galaxies are not tens of billions of years old but less than the required age for an old universe. Amen. Again, evidence for one position is evidence against the other. Well, let's take a look at galaxy formation, because that seems to be a problem, because the evolutionists don't even know how galaxies formed yet. But here's a book called The Facts on File Dictionary of Astronomy, written in 1994. Now, this book has to be true because it has the word facts in there. And this is what they have to say. Galaxies must have condensed out of the gases expanding from the Big Bang. Details of the formation of galaxies are still highly uncertain, as is their subsequent evolution. Now, notice the words must have. That means they don't have a clue. They're just assuming it happened because of a belief in evolution not based on any observable science. So why is this statement any more scientific than in the beginning God created. You see, we're being taught a faith in our science classroom. Our students are being forced to listen to and hear a faith 
called evolution. We need to keep science to the science classrooms, not somebody else's faith. So we've looked at the two models. We've looked at evidence for age. Now let's look at the origin of stars. Where did all these trillions of stars come from? And again, I want to use this statement. Are we being given all the evidence or just selected data to support a particular idea called evolution? Well, let's look at the different models for how stars originated. The evolution model postulates that stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. The theistic model assumes stars evolved billions of years before the Earth. Notice there's no difference between those two models there. But the biblical model clearly states that on day one, God made the earth, and on day four, he made the stars. So we have a difference in these models now. Well, let's take a look what a prominent astronomer has to say out there, Dr. Hugh Ross. He's an astronomer and also one of the leaders in this progressive creationist movement. And this is his statement about star formation. And he says this, the entire process of stellar evolution is by natural processes alone. We do not have to invoke divine intervention at any stage in the history of the life cycle of the stars that we observe. Now, notice he's saying this. We don't need to invoke God at any stage of stellar formation. That means the origin of stars or any part of the stars' formation or evolution process. Now, is that statement consistent with the Bible? Well, let's take a look. What does the Bible have to say about stars? Well, Genesis 1.16 says this. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Right there, that says that statement by the progressive creationist movement is absolutely wrong. But you know, the Bible even says more. Isaiah 40, 26 says this. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? The Bible teaches clearly that God made the stars. Psalm 8.3 says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. And there's more. Exodus 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Six days he made everything. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and the host of them. Psalm 148, verse 5 says, For he commanded, and they were created. Isaiah 45, 12 says, I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. And then Nehemiah 9, 6 says, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host. John 1, 3 says, All things were made by him. Revelation 4, 11 says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So is stellar formation by natural processes compatible with Scripture? Absolutely not. Right there, that says the entire progressive creationist movement is false. They are not teaching the Bible. It is by the word of the Lord that the heavens and the host of the heavens, the stars, the moon, and the sun were created. The Bible is very clear on that issue. So let's take a scientific look at star formation. How are stars formed? What is the popular theory out there for how stars are formed? When we open up these textbooks and we read about astronomy, we read all these other books, they talk about, first of all, we have to have this gas and dust cloud. This gas and dust cloud is swirling around out there. And as it swirls around and around, it begins to gravitationally collapse in on itself, and a star is formed. Is that true? Absolutely not. You can go to your basic physics books and read about gas pressures and find out that kind of a statement is not true. See, as a gas and dust cloud swirls around, it will begin to gravitationally collapse in on itself. But what, cause, what happens as a result of that is called heat pressure. And that heat pressure from all those gas molecules moving faster and faster will cause that gas cloud to expand out and overtake the gravitational impact. So as a cloud swirls around and around, it will not gravitationally collapse. It will expand. Now, it is theoretically possible to collapse, but it has to be such a condensed form 
to overtake the heat pressure. But we see none of that out there. Let's see what some of the scientists have to say about their observations of gas at dust clouds. Again, Don DeYoung, PhD in physics, writes, the complete birth of a star has never been observed. The principles of physics demand some special conditions for star formation and also for a long time period. A cloud of hydrogen gas must be compressed to a sufficiently small size so that gravity dominates. And then he concludes, in space, however, almost every gas cloud is light years in size, hundreds of times greater than the critical size needed for a stable star. As a result, outward gas pressures cause these clouds to spread out farther, not contract. Here's Fred Whipple in his book, The Mystery of Comets, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian Institute Press, says this. Precisely how a section of an interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse. You know, you won't see any of these kind of quotes in school textbooks. Why? Because once they get in there, once the true science gets in the textbooks, evolution doesn't look so good. Here's Danny Faulkner again, PhD in astronomy, states this. To many astronomers, it seems reasonable that stars could form from these clouds of gas. Most astronomers believe that the clouds gradually contract under their own weight to form stars. This process has never been observed. But if it did occur, it would take many human lifetimes. And he concludes, it is known that clouds do not spontaneously collapse to form stars. The clouds possess considerable mass, but they are so large that their gravity is very feeble. Any decrease in size would be met by an increase in gas pressure that would cause a cloud to re-expand. And here's Hans Albin, Nobel Prize winner, NASA, says, there is general belief that stars are forming by gravitational collapse. In spite of vigorous efforts, no one has yet found any observational indication of confirmation. Thus, the generally accepted theory of stellar formation may be one of a hundred unsupported dogmas which constitute a large part of present-day astrophysics. The observed evidence clearly supports we don't know how stars form by natural processes. There's no one has ever seen a star form. Anybody who makes the claim they have seen a star, seen a star form must be very old because it would take thousands of years for this thing to happen. And finally, here's a couple more astronomers wrote in Science Journal. Despite numerous efforts, we have yet to directly observe the process of stellar formation. The origin of stars represents one of the fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. But now let's go back to our facts on file dictionary of astronomy. Again, we got the word facts in there. It's got to be true. And this is what they're teaching out of there. Stars are formed by gravitational collapse of cool, dense gas and dust clouds. Isn't that incredible? They could sit there and make that statement with no observation, no observable evidence, but yet they continue to make that statement. That is forcing faith onto the public. But notice what they say a little further down. There are problems, however, in, in initiating the collapse of a gas cloud. It resists collapse because, of, firstly, its internal motions and heating effects of nearby stars. Secondly, the centrifugal support due to rotation. And thirdly, the magnetic field pressure. In other words, what they said so far is they believe stars are forming this way, even though all the evidence says no. What a strong belief system you have to have to accept evolution. And then they conclude with this. In a massive, dense cloud shielded by dust, it is, notice this word, believed that collapse can be triggered when the cloud is slowed on passing through the spiral density wave pattern of our galaxy. The whole idea of star formation is based on belief, not observable science. But yet, that is being passed off in our classrooms as science. Why 
should we accept somebody else's belief when we already have a belief system? Why should our students be forced into learning one particular belief system when there are many belief systems out there? Because they're being held captive by something called evolution and the proponents of evolution. Oh, but wait a minute, Mike. What about these star nurseries out there? What about these great big clouds of, of gas and dust out there? Such as the Eagle Nebula, that great picture we saw in the newspaper and press called Star Nurseries. These great big nebula out there with these big fingers, dense clouds of fingers pointing up there, and these bright spots in there. Aren't those star nurseries, aren't, isn't that evidence that stars are being formed right there in front of our eyes? No, it is not. You see, once again, we're not being told all the information. We're being told just selected information because some people want everyone to believe in evolution, not science. You see, what causes this? We have these big dark nebula, gas and dust clouds out there. Then we have these other kinds of clouds out there called emission nebula, very bright. And when these two kinds of nebula collide, they force these great big fingers, dark nebula fingers, gas and dust to spiral up there. And you see these very hot, bright spots at the fingertips here, as we saw in the Eagle Nebula. Now, are those stars forming? Well, not by any evidence we know. Because when we take a look at those temperatures, and we try and measure the temperatures there, what well, we find out these bright spots, the temperature is about 10,000 Kelvin. That is so hot, it could never collapse in. It will have to expand. And sometimes what we're seeing out there, we look out there and we say, oh, we didn't see this bright spot before. Now there is one. Well, the reason we're seeing one there now, we didn't see it before, is this gas and dust cloud is expanding, and we're now being able to see areas we couldn't see before because this gas and dust cloud, the thick gas and dust cloud, has hidden it for a while, and it took time for it to expand now. So are stars forming there? Not by any observable evidence we know of. For example, the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. Images, this was one time thought to be a star nursery. But just recently, images taken by the European Southern Observatory, a very large telescope in January 2002, verified this structure is not collapsing and forming stars. It is expanding. The same thing we believe is happening in the Eagle Nebula and all these other so-called star nursery clouds. So we need to examine all the evidence. But that's not allowed in many of our schools today because we are being captured by a faith called evolution. Well, I like to use numbers here. I like numbers. What I want to do is see if the evolution model really holds up against numbers. All right. Well, that's interesting. Did you grab all that? That old scientific facts? <laughs> uh, let me translate for you. Everything he was saying was that they're making up a bunch of stuff, a bunch of... Uh, conclusions without evidence to support it. Well, let's, let's have a word of prayer before we dismiss, shall we? Our Father, we're thankful that you have given us the Word of God to guide us and give us the absolute truth. We don't have to suppose. We don't have to make believe. We know what your Word says, and we believe it to be true. And Lord, we thank you for your power. Thank you for your majesty. Thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you that you've made us aware of what you wanted us to know. God, we thank you for our church, and we pray you'd bless us. Bless this evening. Bless our people in Jesus' name. Amen.